So for about two of the last three years, well, first of all, I've been at Oxford for some time now, the Future of Humanity Institute, which was uh, founded and run by one Nick Bostrom, author of a book that, well, how many have heard of a book called Superintelligence? Superintelligence, yeah. Uh, so I worked across the hall from him. I've been working on a recently completed a report, book-length report titled Reframing Superintelligence on Comprehensive AI Services as a Model of, as an Anticipated Form of General Intelligence. And Nick says he would like to see this sort of turned into a book package, and instead it's a, a PDF with internal links, and it's a tree-structured document, and not really properly academic, it's a bunch of conceptual technical material. So the way to read this is not to read it. It's big. What you want to do is download it. There's the URL, for say, the, the FHI homepage reframing, and read the table of contents. Okay, you look for any part there, it's a bunch of declarative sentences. It reads as a summary of, of the whole, whole body of work. And click through on anything that looks particularly interesting or wrong. And you'll get about 80% of the value. So, How much of it is wrong? Uh, no. <laughs> How much of it? No. How much of your material is wrong? Okay, we'll quiz you later, Brad. Okay. Um, There has been a well, history of what, what are all these things crossed off here. I started giving basically this talk. The first, this is the first of four slides that are a talk that I've been given at uh, DeepMind and Oxford and Googleplex and Stanford and the Center for Human Compatible AI's workshop down in Asilomar. Uh, and all these except the first two are on this trip. Uh, open AI, Open Philanthropy, Partnership on AI. So there are four slides and then a special one for this, this, uh, this session. And with that, for a bit of context, I will note that if we're going to think about decentralized approaches to AI, then it must be that we're not talking about a model that says that the human race moves along and that at some point AI bursts up in the form of a unified uh, rational utility directed agent that we, have, that we then have to try to get it to do what we want uh, with it, it having long-term plans, internal motivations, and so on. In that kind of world, you do not have a decentralized approach to AI. The reason that people settled on the rational utility directed agent model was that they regarded it as an abstraction that got away from anthropomorphism. Utility function could be anything. The problem with that model is that it was developed as a model, an idealized model of human decision makers. So if you're working within the model of a rational utility directed agent, you are working with an abstract model of human beings and not a model of intelligence in a general sense. So today, instead of uh, focusing on this historic view of AI as supermind, we can ask questions like, where does AI, AI systems come from? Well, today they come from research and development. Well, what do they do? They perform tasks, which I'm going to describe as providing services in bounded time with bounded resources for some, some bounded purpose. And tasks are things like uh, Google Translate, uh, getting the cover of nature by playing a good game of Go, uh, image recognition, helping a self-driving car, and so on and so forth. Well, what will AI systems be able to do? If we take AI seriously, eventually the answer is everything humans do and a lot more at a, at a higher level. That includes automating human tasks and more. And with that as, as common sense background, we can ask what is research and development? From this perspective, the answer is it's a bunch of tasks to automate that are being automated increasingly. More and more conventional automation of software infrastructure and more and more application of AI techniques to generating new AI models. Uh, it's architecture search, hyperparameter optimization by, by, by interesting AI flavored means, and a lot more. Where does that lead? Well, uh, if you are automating asymptotically all human tasks, then asymptotically you are automating AI R&D completely, in the limited case. And that looks like not what has been called recursive improvement of an agent, but recursive improvement of a technology base. AI moving forward at AI speed, not because there's an agent trying to be a better agent to accomplish something in the world, 
but because there's a very capable pool of resources and people are continually you know, pulling on it, pushing in resources, and, and pulling out uh, functional systems. And where does that lead? Well, to what can be called comprehensive AI services, including critically the service of developing new services. That's where generality comes from. And uh, when I was writing this, I, was, I called it the case model. And I went to the Puerto Rico beneficial AGI meeting in January, which finally got me to finish this, 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 this report, because I wanted to have it ready in time. And they said, no, 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 we've been waiting for the report. It's great that it's out. And by the way, it's not called case. It's called KAIS. So now I've, I've told people I'm going to go with whatever, whatever pronunciation becomes standard, but I was told it's, it's KAIS. So it's KAIS for now. <laughs> Okay, so the argument here is that automated service development is general intelligence, and the C in the, the KAIS model does the work of G in AGI. And the only problem I have with AGI is that people always mean an agent. And a set of services cannot be modeled as an agent. It's something more general. You can have agents as products. In principle, you could have classic AGI agents that are developed from this along this path. But it's a different world. It recontexts problems. There are possibilities that are that one has if you have a pool of targeted resources that do things you want that are not tools you have available if there's this one thing that has a purpose of its own. So is this a useful model of AGI? I think it is in several ways. It can help us understand the implications of mundane progress. And what people are doing every day in AI R&D is moving toward a kind of general intelligence. It's increasing automation of increasingly flexible and powerful models. Uh, what about implications of progress that people think of as toward AGI? Well, if you are doing that, you're developing models that are more general, uh, easier to retarget, learn from less data, uh, are able to do perhaps re-architecting. All of these processes that people think of that lead to a more general and capable system, broader learning, are processes that help you do research and development. They help you develop new systems that can perform new tasks. So if one is marching on a road that is aimed at AGI, you'll find that the pieces of technology are constantly being pulled out and used to develop services. So on that path, you expect to see a vast pool of, of, of technologies and services. And this reframes the AI boxing problem. Heard the AI boxing problem? How do you keep the AI in the box? Well, this, this turns it around. The question is, how can you get enough AI into one box to matter? You'd have to have one system that, in effect, is outperforming the research and development capacity of the whole world, and otherwise, most of the capabilities outside the box. So this points to prospects for steeply accelerating progress. The, have many people look at the classic AGI recursive improvement model and they say this requires breakthroughs, who knows when, maybe we don't believe it. Uh, this model says generality can come from rapid extension of, extension of the kinds of model development that we have. Recursive improvement looks like automating AI R&D. And looked at from that point of view, I, people rather consistently update toward a higher probability of powerful general AI and the potential for more serious possibility of a relatively rapid progress toward a steep, steep growth process, uh, rapid, steeply accelerating progress. And finally, for this slide, uh, there are many potential affordances for AI safety. There are more ways of getting a hold of systems and doing something that's useful from the point of view of interpretability, control, uh, structuring systems to, to behave more the way that, that you want them to. So a few of those. Uh, optimization, often the idea of optimization is the system is more powerful, more capable, more general. Well, an engineer in optimization usually means better for some purpose. And uh, if you think of optimizing a wheeled vehicle for high speed, it might make a good race car. And if you think of optimizing a wheeled vehicle for carrying a large refrigerated volume, that sounds like a refrigerated truck. But a really excellent refrigerated truck is not a race car. A really excellent race car is not a refrigerated truck. And if you wanted to have a fast vehicle that carried a refrigerator with it, it wouldn't be very good for either. But maybe it's good for uh, uh, delivering very cold pizza or something. I don't know. Another importance is uh, implementation relationships. Uh, the, the classic picture says an AI system is doing something and it's re-architecting itself. That seems a little strange. Doing something is one task, and architecting an AI system is a different task. 
So if we think of C, service C as translation, and B as a system that does translation, then A is a system that develops translators. Google Translate isn't trying to be a better translator. It is, if you can think of it as trying anything, it's just trying to translate the next sentence well. So this obviously gives more structure and control to a process of getting better AI systems. There are more, more, more points of, well, key point, separation of learning and, and performance is actually implied by these implementation relationships. And that points to having systems that have stable competencies. You make a system, it does something, you have another release of hopefully a tech, uh, what is hopefully a, a, a tested version of a system. And just as we call a child uh, intelligent because the child can learn, but not necessarily because the child is, is highly competent, and we call an expert intelligent because the expert is highly competent, but not because the expert can learn. Uh, you know, if the expert doesn't know anything more next month, well, it's still an expert and highly capable of solving problems. So intelligence has these two meanings that are in principle completely separate. In practice are in standard ML practice. And yet, if you look at the literature on super intelligent systems, you'll find that that distinction between two separable kinds of intelligence isn't there in the definition. And there's an Im implication that if the system is doing it is also learning. But the fact that that's optional, I mean, it's useful in many cases, but the fact that it's optional means that one can have stable competencies, which is useful if you want safety. Uh, matching tasks to services is a somewhat longer story, but the idea is that tasks can be clustered in sort of an abstract space, some more tasks close together, it's a high dimensional space, and it can be thought of as an embedding space in, in ML terms. And now we have a kind of interpretability. If a planning system is very general and it's drawing on a wide range of competencies, you can see what competencies, if you're watching, your principal can see what competencies are being drawn on. Uh, if the system is supposed to be preparing food uh, and it's, it's accessing information about uh, foods and recipes and food chemistry and neurotoxins as something to detect and avoid, that's great. If it's and, you know, how to package things uh, attractively and so on. But if it's accessing information on organic synthesis of neurotoxins and how to conceal them in food, maybe you're worried. So in machine learning, typically, we cannot understand what's going on inside these opaque neural networks. But if you know what the neural network was trained to do and what it wasn't trained to do, what it was optimized for, which focuses capabilities, then you have a kind of transparency. You have a kind of interpretability. Just one level up, what is the task that's being performed? And a system that's doing a composition of tasks in a higher level task is now, now has some, some transparency. Predictive models of human concerns, um, the language translation system, you'd like it to know everything about people and the world so that it can translate well. If you want a system to have a resource that can indicate whether something is a good idea or not, some action is going to be approved of by people, disapproved will be important, but it's hard to know what people will think. Well, that's a predictive model. In principle, you could have a very high level system that has been trained on reading what people have been writing over the last, I don't know, a thousand years about things in the world and what people think about them. Uh, advice columns, news, history, uh, you know, collected works of philosophy on AI. Uh, all of this can be used to train a model that has a pretty good ability to predict what people will definitely like and what they definitely won't like. And if one is concerned with AI alignment, well, uh, a system that is trying to do the right thing could consult an oracle like this. And the oracle isn't an agent. It's possibly very intelligent in some sense, but it's a predictive model. Input, description, output, what will people probably think of this? An affordance that one has with diverse systems, but not a single agent, is there's competition. You can't model society as a single agent because you can talk to different people and you're talking to different people and people are competing and cooperating and have adversarial relationships. Same story among AI systems. <clears throat> Implicitly, all AI systems performing a particular function are competing with each other for occupying the space of attractive systems that people find worth running and copying and modifying for the next version, the evolutionary process. Uh, we also have systems that are adversarial. A trivial example of that is today's generative adversarial networks, where there are two parts, and one is trying to generate images, and the other is trying to distinguish them from 
uh, real images from fake images. They have opposed, opposed objective functions, but they serve us very well. And there are many cases where you want a you know, system that's, that's doing some economic activity, some other system that's automating, a system that's designing systems, and another system that's criticizing them. It's all very natural. It means that it isn't the robots versus us. It's a bunch of systems that are doing things, some of which are checking up on other systems and competing to provide us with services. Okay, mentioned adversarial systems. There's a lot to be said about that. One is looking at the potential for long-term strategic stability in the world. You want to play red team, blue team games and simulation until you really think you know what defensive stability looks like. Differential deployment. If you have distinct capabilities, you can deploy distinct capabilities. It's not turning loose a perfectly general AI system. It's a matter of you, you, you have the, the potential to have some influence on the, the trajectory of your of society, military affairs, and so on by differentially deploying focused competencies. And that's true even if you find that the right way to do AI systems is to have very broad models trained on, on the world in some general sense. One can still have focused competencies through interfaces that are fine-tuned and task-specific. So even, even in the case where the underlying technology wants to give you, I don't know, if you look at GPT-2, the model out of, out of OpenAI, uh, it's trained on a corpus of, of, of language. Uh, to the extent that it knows things, it's hard to know how much it knows. It seems to kind of know an awful lot about the world. And it's very useful. But if one wants, one can have a, a so-called task head on top of it and fine tune to answer questions or to write poetry. And those interfaces can be provided and they're focused services. So that is the, those are the four slides that I've uh, had in the, given, used in these talks that I mentioned. And in general, you go to places where people say, oh, they're working on AGI, you know, DeepMind, where I spend about a day a month uh, OpenAI, which I you know, visit visit every every time I come out to the Bay Area, and and give talks. And the general view is that this is a common sense picture of what's happening, the natural path forward. Uh, you know, Paul Cristiano and I have very different approaches to thinking about things, but we don't seem to disagree on very much. Uh, he you know, says this is a seems to be a a, a natural a natural path forward also. So the work that I'm doing currently is to ask, what can AI do for us? Uh, what does the world look like if we have a great expansion in what I'm calling general implementation capacity? The ability to go from human intentions and goals to novel, highly capable systems, services in the world deployed at scale. And if one talks about improving automation, well, that's a kind of a narrow thing, and you still have bottlenecks elsewhere. If you talk about better design, well, that's sort of narrow, and there are bottlenecks elsewhere. If you can produce wonderful systems, there are bottlenecks because it takes time for people to learn to use them. But walk through a decomposition of this. Design. Well, if you have much faster design and interaction with people that has, a, has strong priors on what they definitely want or don't want, uh, one can, with high-level AI, very rapidly design systems and design model X and gaps. We're seeing AI in, uh, in computer-aided design now increasingly. The, the problem that, 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 that some of these companies are addressing is, rather than uh, having, helping a human engineer to laboriously design something, instead the human engineer defines functionality at the boundary, this point of simple things like single, kind of complex, but single components. The system comes back with a huge range of options. And the problem isn't for the engineer to generate one. The problem is for the engineer to browse this set of options and have them be presented in a way that, that makes it easy for the engineer to find their way through the space of possibilities. Very different task. So the design bottleneck can, in principle, be thoroughly broken. Increasingly, as we go to high-level AI, and at some point, very thoroughly. Well, design leads to development, overlaps with development. Building, building concrete things, learning, learning from uh, experimenting with them in the world, uh, the, the idiosyncrasies of, of uh, their internal interactions, a lot of work that goes from, from between design and development, overlapping, leading to deployment. Uh, first you're sort of beta versions and then more. Deployment involves manufacturing, and 
Certainly we're looking toward much more powerful automation, uh, greater ability to, to rapidly turn designs that have been developed and refined into production at scale. But deployment leads to application, and application today is in part bottlenecked on the need for people to you know, learn to do uh, installation and maintenance and deal with interfaces that require a bunch of training, often you need a lot of people working together on some complicated system to make it work. But if we take AI seriously, uh, we should expect to have quite effective robotics, systems that can install things, systems that can maintain things, and the systems themselves being highly adaptive. So it is the people adapt, learning and adapting to the system, it's the systems increasingly adapting to people. And finally, uh, or actually throughout this process, we have adaptation, where one learns from, from experience, from interactions with people, feedback. Uh, one, you know, AI systems are good at collecting and integrating information and, and can fed back into this process, can aid design and development, deployment, and deployment of new revised systems. So this entire process, including the feedback loops, the bottlenecks can, as we get to higher level AI, all of those can be, can be collapsed in time, reduced in cost. And so the prospect is one of being able to take human desires, including quite complex ones and ones that are emergent from, you know, from institutional processes and, and markets and so on, and turn those into systems that are designed at, you know, up toward a super intelligent level of capability. Uh, that are complex, well-tested, highly functional, deployed rapidly at scale, and can change the world. And so, in closing, I think the key question increasing will be, what can we ask for and get in a path-dependent way, which includes not having a lot of opposition, and to avoid a lot of opposition, it's important that we ask for things that other groups regard as in their interest as well. I think that includes non-libelous kinds of material abundance and defensive stability in military systems. And uh, I think we need to think hard about what paths forward might work there, how to work through the ideas, how to bring in broader communities, and to eventually have a situation in which when the world is beginning to change rapidly, implementation capacity is on the verge of and beginning to expand rapidly, that decision makers finally say, this isn't business as usual, what do we do? We want at that point for there to be a clear picture that is very appealing to more or less all of them. So that's uh, some vision for where we might go, and I think it has to look decentralized because nobody particularly wants to be under the thumb of one thing or one group of people. While I'm setting up, let's do maybe one or two quick questions. Um, okay, uh, just here, over there. Oh, can you can you just be uh, loud. loud? Yeah. Uh, great talk. Um, a question I had was around your software comment that we get safety assurances um, from a couple of points you made, in particular the difference between um, learning and um, I learning and, and, and confidence, some term like that, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that the more, um, you know, the more general you have your learning that may actually involve experimentation and action. Um, I think there was also that, that example you gave where an AI may be learning about neurotoxins, which is fine, and then also learning about food, which is fine, but I could imagine if there's some auditing AI that the, um, the researching AI could get around it by, say, learning about some kinds of chemicals, and then it turns out that you know, insertion for this particular mm -hmm. type, maybe at the wrong dosage where it's poisonous. So I'm just curious as to how much you really think those safety assurances are actually given by the differentiations you mentioned. Well, I'm describing, describing them as, as affordances. They're, 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 in fact, things one can grab, levers one can pull. Hmm? Excuse me, uh, the term I've been using is affordances because assurances, as, as you're suggesting, is too strong a term. Uh, nothing here gives assurance of much of anything, particularly if it's about someone else developing systems uh, and without, without uh, you know, out, outside of your sphere of control or mine. In the case that you're pointing to, um, if you had a system that was planning to try to circumvent the rules, sitting back, 
here's this pool of AI services. There's already learned you know, competencies in neurotoxin synthesis and so on. You know, a system could say, we're not going to touch that because people will see there will be suspicion. Instead, we'll piece together that knowledge in some other way. But that's assuming that one has an adversary already. If you imagine that there is a super intelligent level system that is trying to circumvent, there are still tactics one can use, there are affordances to help, but you've got a problem. I think you're better off if you avoid it. And one way of avoiding it is to have the ability to always have the focus be on, on tasks that are tasks we want, which doesn't include poisoning people, and to have some transparency onto planning uh, so that, well, I don't know, if, if a system is beginning to think about how to cheat us and fool us, it's probably drawing on, uh, on planning services uh, that are about, uh, about that kind of behavior. And doing that before it has the competency to carry through a scheme. Is this an assurance? No. Uh, but there are handles there. There are tools and forces one can bring into play that help more than if you didn't have them. Right. Oh, I um, think we should. I think Brad, do we need to? Yeah, but you've been across from Nick, of course, who just released a paper calling for more centralization of control in order to stop our technology. Yes. So, what is his feeling about your call for decentralization? Uh, which makes it harder to. to well, he wants to, to get more attention, but then in, in Oxford, they're not much prone to having schools of thought and trying to suppress other schools of thought. I'll just say that uh, I had some input into that paper and pushed it in the direction of. Or for example, rule of law rather than central planning kind of oversight, uh, talking in terms of what constraints are necessary rather than speaking of social control as a general mechanism. Yes, our, our, our views there are divergent. I keep on pushing toward things that look to me more like liberal society values. All right, with that being said, which then he, has we, we some set, he has in some sets, but then when it turns into perceptions of what politics looks like and structuring society, uh, I think they're problematic. So, I mean, the way I would look at it, though, is I think the big problem in AI safety is not runaway goals and adversarial AI, it's just bad humans using the tools and a system which makes it easier for asymmetric access to mm. wide ranges of powerful tools could result in some of that. Yes, we can talk further, and that, I think, is quite correct. And we will talk further in the discussion uh, and also after like the other uh, short talks. And I think that will definitely be kind of like a Pandora's box that will be open again later because we're going to be hearing about like two other uh, decentralized approaches to AI um, kind of that are trying to reframe the current existing paradigm. Um, so for the next kind of 20 minutes or so, I want to ask Mark Miller up on stage. So Mark, Christine and I have been writing this paper on decentralized approaches to existential risk a little while ago. And there we basically like lay out a way in which we can kind of like reframe super, um, super intelligence in the sense that civilization could be regarded as a super intelligence. And then we've recently kind of like started writing a book on strengthening civilization where we kind of outline, okay, given that we accept uh, that, you know, we have those more decentralized models of, um, of AI and how can we push for those? So what I want to do now is kind of like race through the paper bring you up to speed on like what we discussed there. And if you're more interested, the paper is kind of out here. But then what I afterwards want to do is kind of ask Mark a little bit about, okay, what are we kind of discussing in the book? How do we actually get there? Because I think that's more the interesting part. So if I'm racing through, too fast through this, be advised there's this paper out there. I'm just trying to get you kind of like broadly up to speed so I can, that we can talk about like the more interesting bits that are not out there yet. Okay, so basically, what do we claim in the paper? Well, first we claim kind of like what's kind of problematic with the unipolar, oh, if you start standing, you can be standing for a little bit. So what we basically claim that, you know, what's, what's kind of like problematic with the unipolar approach to AI is that it's kind of attempting to construct this one powerful entity that acts in human interest. And for that, it's kind of like necessary to ask and also answer some really, really hard philosophical problems and it also kind of claims that like a few designer or like, you know, like at least a few individuals, if not everyone, uh, can do that sufficiently satisfactorily. And that's problematic because values really differ, right? We have values that differ largely across humans, right? Our moral intuitions, whether it's like consequential intuitions, deontological intuitions, or virtue ethics or whatever, they can all be traced back to some evolutionary starting condition or to our culture or social 
uh, context and it's really hard to stand outside of that and say, hey, my values are kind of like more objective um, and, um, and more meaningful than yours. And even if we manage to do that across humans, and there's a second question of like, well, what about values across time? Clearly our fish ancestors had very different values to ours, right? And so we can kind of predict that our values will be very different to the values of kind of our biological and our robotic descendants. And Robin will say a few uh, words more probably about value drift, I'm assuming. Uh, this is his book that's out there here. Um, and so the question is like, well, is it even possible that we lock our values into this one unipolar agent? And if it was possible, should we even try to, given the fact that we're quite happy that our fish ancestors didn't uh, lock in their values, um, perhaps, presumably, that, that could be true um, for future civilizations as well. And then lastly, the question is, well, um, values supposedly also differ quite a lot across systems. Um, Eliezer Yukowski has the story on Three Worlds Collide, where he basically talks about uh, kind of like humans meeting this other alien civilization um, for, for whom it was evolutionary adapt, uh, adaptive to eat their own babies. Um, that, you know, is morally appalling to us, but, you know, you could imagine an evolutionary context in which something like that, um, you know, was uh, kind of like was adaptive and so rational. And so it's really, really hard to see how we engage with like value systems that are very, di very different to ours. In the context of AI, it's also interesting because how can we kind of assume that we can like load our values that have arisen in our kind of like human evolutionary context into mind architectures that are very, very different to ours. So this is all to say, hey, this is really, really hard. Um, is there a way in which we don't have to solve all those problems? Is there a way in which we don't have to meet that deadline? Um, basically, what we propose is, well, rather than trying to replace civilization, which is a system that has worked quite well, with this novel artificial super intelligence, that we then have to try to align with human values, we should rather instead try to strengthen civilization because civilization already is goal aligned with humans and it is already super intelligent. And that rests on two premises. It's already goal aligned and it's already super intelligent. How is civilization already goal aligned? Well, number one, um, I think that you know civilization as a framework already allows most of us to realize whatever goals we have without having to agree on it. So it's basically creating a framework in which you and I, even though we don't agree on all of the values that we have, can kind of coexist peacefully and can still kind of like, at least not imperfectly, that's true, but can kind of like realize the values that we have more and more peacefully over time. And not only that, we can also try to cooperate in ways um, that we can actually further our values without having to make a judgment about which of them is ultimately right. And civilization has kind of evolved in a way through norms, laws, and institutional frameworks that enables humanity to do that better and better over time. Stephen Pinker has this book on the decline of violence, right? Better angels of our nature. This has worked better and better. We have more and more voluntary interactions by which people um, can engage increasingly more in ways that is mutually beneficial for both parties. And that is kind of correlated strongly with a bunch of kind of like different things and progress in a lot of different areas that we care about, for example, here the decrease in poverty. And so the idea is that civilization doesn't really have a utility function, okay, fair enough, but it does have a tropism, and civilization tends, at least imperfectly, to grow a period of preferred paths, right? And by enabling more and more of those interactions that are mutually beneficial. So this is kind of a way in which we can say civilization is already kind of goal aligned with us. Um, on, uh, by, an, by enabling all of us to, to the best uh, of its possibility to kind of like achieve uh, what we value. Then how is civilization intelligent? Well, um, civilization as a whole, as our claim, is already a super intelligence composed of both human and machine intelligences. And here's this kind of like intelligence test for civilization, which is, well, what's a good intelligence test here? Well, imagine a box um, that can say contains an industrial civilization and this box will solve a vastly greater range of problems than a box containing a person alone, right? And so our claim is that this ability to solve externally posed problems can be taken kind of as a proxy um, of an ecosystem's intelligence. And yes, we grant everyone that as machines become more and more intelligent, they will contribute more and more to the intelligence of civilization, but it doesn't really matter because kind of the overarching larger intelligence is still civilization as a whole. Okay, so if you grant us that civilization is goal-aligned and that is already a super intelligence, then 
it would be really, really good if instead of replacing the system that has worked really well so far for us um, with another intelligence and trying to align that artificial intelligence with our values, we should instead try to use intelligence as it is emerging to strengthen the system that has worked pretty well over time. And so our claim is basically that our efforts should focus more and more on directing this technological ability that this unitary breakthrough of a unipolar AI would represent to itself become widely deployed as a multitude of different entities in the world, right? And these entities can then take part as interactive agents in the fabric of civilization, deployed by different parties simultaneously to serve many different ends. And this, is, this last bit is really important, right? Many different parties and many different ends. As we've seen kind of earlier in like, you know, the goal alignment of civilization, kind of we propose that the safety of civilization really rests on the claim that of the lack of utility function, right? It is a negotiated compromise that accommodates a great, a great diversity of intelligent entities and their values already with no one entity dominating, which is also, I think, what Eric um, kind of like closed this talk on. And it would be also really nice if on top of that, rather than just like them coexisting with each other and like us having many different values systems coexist, it would be great if many of those goals could also be best served by cooperating with other entities, just as we do already. So ultimately, what we're claiming is that um, you know, we'd like to create a, a utopia that allows for a diversity of utopias in the way that we want to create a multipolar world in which different entities, whether they are human, AI, or other, can cooperate with each other voluntarily to reach a diversity of different in, um, interests. That's kind of where we stop with the paper, and that's where I'm going to ask Mark to come on stage, because now we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the different ways and how, if, if you agree that, okay, what has worked in civilization pretty well is that it allows more and more voluntary interactions uh, and more and more cooperative interactions, then the next question becomes, okay, how do, we, how do we do more of that, right? How do we get more cooperation going? And here we propose those three items, and for that, I'd love for you to come on stage and to talk a little bit more about them. So, um, yeah, so thank you. Said, it was quite fast. There's more of that um, in the paper, but you know, if we now say, okay, this was kind of like the paper in a nutshell, basically, and there's a lot more to say. But if we now talk about, okay, if you grant us that, you know, we want to increase more voluntary interactions and we want to make the world much more cooperative, the first thing you know that we kind of propose is, well, you want to decrease the risks of cooperation, and the way that we decrease the risk is once by multipolar active shields against physical violence, but then also with increased computer security against digital violence. Do you want to unpack that a little bit? Uh, sure. Um, uh, first of all, my compliments. That was just a tremendously good summary of, of the, the work that we've been doing. Uh, it was really great. So, um, sorry, remind me what you want me to unpack. OK, so you can't see this, but basically our first claim Okay, so here in a nutshell is, first you want to have less of the interactions that are involuntary that you don't want, then you want to enable more of the cooperative interactions that you do want, and then last you also want to enhance those cooperative interactions by like putting better systems in place that would enhance those. But let's take them one by one. So let's start first with how do you decrease involuntary interactions via multipolar active shield and via increased computer security? So the... the the multipolar active shields is actually the, the part of our overall message and the part of, of you know, uh, for me, very much the thing that I'm most uncomfortable with. So I'm sort of starting in uh, the position, the, the particular issue of greatest discomfort. Um, uh, we have had this astonishing decrease in violence. I cannot recommend highly enough um, uh, Stephen Pinker's writings on this, uh, Better Angels by Nature and Enlightenment Now. Uh, and as Allison was showing, uh, the astonishing decrease in violence, especially recently, has correlated very well with this amazing increase in wealth, an amazing decrease in the number of people living in extreme poverty, and uh, having a society in which um, 
involuntary interactions are disappearing and voluntary interactions predominate, there is a, a, a very simple first order element of that, which is uh, entities engage in voluntary interactions when they both expect it to be of benefit. Um, so these are wealth creating interactions. There are many second order and third order terms that interfere with this, collective action problems, et cetera. But the first order term is the dominant first thing to notice. Um, now, the, as technology changes, the means by which involuntary interactions happen change. And it's not necessarily the case that the reduction in violence that we've been seeing won't reverse itself. Um, the, uh, I first want to talk about uh, the, the easy part of this, which is computer security. Yeah. Um, the, all right, the systems, I'm comparatively easy. Um, uh, still, Comparatively uh, uncontroversial. Right, comparatively, but, but uh, still tremendously difficult. Um, the existing infrastructure that civilization rests on, that the computer industry, my industry, is built, is not only massively insecure, it's massively insecurable. Um, uh, it cannot be fixed by incremental engineering starting from where we are. Um, and the reason why this hasn't been a civilization destroying issue so far is that, the, is that the discovery of vulnerabilities and the creation of exploits have themselves had a human bottleneck. Uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge, for example, shows that we're well beyond the AI threshold needed to create automated pathogens that discover vulnerabilities, construct exploits in the wild on their own while probing the, the systems that they're attacking. Um, I give the example, uh, um, uh, an example of the kind of danger that we're walking into. Um, uh, uh, just more conventionally with the degree of insecurity we've got uh, is uh, the self-driving car as fleet of land guided, uh, you know, of guided land missiles, where we've we've uh, we're running these um, self-driving cars on the same crap insecurable operating systems that we know are insecurable, um, uh, and there's nothing about that stack that would indicate that they cannot be taken over on moss in an undetected manner. And we've also um, lovingly endowed them with all the intelligence needed to um, find crowds and plow into them at high speed. So you could have a coordinated attack that, that, that is really quite horrific um, without coming up to the level of the DARPA Grand Challenge that they've already uh, shown. So we have massively insecurable uh, infrastructure. Um, we need a significant, as Robin puts it, refactoring. Uh, we need a, a, a change in the underlying architectural premises. It can be very hard to get there from here. I'm very much involved in this new world of crypto commerce, often referred to as the blockchain sector. Um, uh, I'm very hopeful of, about that as creating an ecosystem in which secure software uh, will dominate because insecure software results in massive losses quickly with no recourse. Uh, we've seen in that, that sector already that insecure software gets killed quickly. The ecosystem is populated by the survivors. So we really have a very different dynamic. And being in that industry, I see a very, very different degree of caring to build secure systems than in my 30 years in the conventional software industry. Um, okay, so that's, if we want to like that, the, yeah. wrap that up and move to the multipolar okay. shields to okay. have like yeah. two more to cover. Okay, um, yeah. sorry about that. Um, uh, these things aren't simple, the, the, um, but um, also there is uh, we go uh, in, in somewhat of more of a length um, into them in the paper on decentralized approaches to X risk two. Okay, so. With regard to physical uh, uh, violence and 
uh, things like uh, constructions of weapons of mass destruction and such things. Um, the issue that Nick Bostrom raises um, is a truly disturbing issue. I consider the, the, the uh, situation as he presents it to be quite nightmarish. Um, but uh, some basic system of decentralized multipolar monitoring to spot dangers uh, with a precedent being um, uh, the uh, very, yes? What do you mean multipolar? Ah, um, uh, many different parties simultaneously monitoring, uh, not, uh, not, not as part of one jointly coordinated conspiracy, but representing separate interests. So David Brin wrote this uh, wonderful book a wonderful scary book called The Transparent Society, saying that the technological progress will bring us to a world uh, of mass surveillance just because you know, if, if, you, if you can build uh, flying microscopic cameras, um, uh, there's no way, the only way to stop mass surveillance would be mass surveillance. Um, so uh, what he says is that we should stop focusing on the question of whether or not there is mass surveillance, we should, because uh, then we're going to be fighting the losing battle, we should focus instead on what is the nature of surveillance. So there's this term surveillance, the bottom up, multipolar, so that, uh, so that um, uh, the corrupting, um, uh, so that government loses their privacy uh, fully as well, and all of us can exercise democratic controls and inspection. Uh, of the government because the, um, the surveillance technology is multiply sourced, is multiply deployed, and it's understood that uh, it's the fact that no one is in control, no one party is in control, makes that system as safe as it might be. Uh, and that we don't, and that the system that we would really like, which is the absence of uh, such surveillance is not one we know how to achieve. Uh, the next step. That's in the, the active argument, shield part about it. Right. So the next step in the argument that Bryn does not take, which I will take, is that um, mass robotic enforcement is also inevitable. Um, that one of the earliest places where you're going to get deployment of robotic technology are places where what it's replacing are people in harm's way. And that what it's doing is something that you can automate. We're seeing uh, leading indicators of this, with, for example, uh, the drones being used for warfare. Um, uh, so the natural progression of how, we, of how um, enforcement gradually gets automated over time is one that, that I think if we don't realize the dangers and intervene to do a course correction, I think it's very easy for it to lead to a lot of the totalitarian nightmares that are the worst case. Um, uh, I think that um, a system of watchers that watch each other, a system of, um, of, of emergent uh, norms of what these things should be doing um, uh, such that their um, uh, such that systems that that violate those norms are in turn suppressed by the other ones. Um, uh, now, I should say, now that I've stated this, I also want to say I'm profoundly disturbed to have been brought by the logic of some of these arguments to this, and to and to a large extent. I don't believe it. So now let me, I'll just state the counter argument. Um, uh, the counter argument is that um, without some large centrally coordinated activity, people are very good at solving problems. Uh, if we just, we don't know really that this is the character of the problem, we should not. You know, like Nick Bostrom, we should not self 
self-impose a semi-totalitarian regime because we anticipate a semi-totalitarian regime. Let's go forward and see what the problems actually are. And if we don't try to centralize decision making, then we have the decentralized uh, super intelligence of civilization as a whole that brings all of our problem solving ability to bear so we can react to the actual dangers as they occur rather than trying to anticipate and react to a simplified form of the dangers. Chris? Um, it seems like this, this last little part that you're saying seems to go along with observing what Pinker's been observing. Right? Pinker doesn't explain what the mechanism is. He doesn't know what the mechanism is. He observes that violence has been going down. It's happening without us knowing how or why. Mm -hmm. And uh, hoping to ride the, the continuation of that trend um, rather than expecting that things are all going to go to hell in a handbasket and we post guards on every corner seems like maybe it leads to better safety. So, um, so I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I, I like that much better. Um, the thing that, to me, is the greatest source of concrete danger is that we have large centralized governments that do employ force uh, to enforce systems of rules that essentially nobody understands. Um, uh, and to enforce it not in a neutral way. Uh, and the natural progression of technology would be one in which those are the ones that gradually deploy robotic enforcement systems. And if nothing's done to, to throw a monkey wrench into that process, I very much fear where that's leading. It turns out it may not take that much intelligence to create charges in this country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think like a nice thing uh, that I like about that approach of like this multipolar enforcement of active shield is that it kind of like finds like a space um, between uh, kind of two options that seem mutually exclusive. So on the one hand, how the paper vulnerable world hypothesis points out by Bostrom, you know, currently we're in the semi-anarchic default condition by which a small kind of like number of actors can cause like massive harm, and that clearly seems bad. On the other hand, what we also want to avoid is like you know one central actor. Um, you know, they can monitor everyone else, but then we have a single point of, fa of failure, right? So those are two problems um, with kind of like two options, but they're not mutually exclusive, right? You can do something in, in between where you have a multipolar kind of actor shield that avoids that small scale actors can cause massive harm, while on the other hand, avoiding that like one single entity can lead, leads to a single point of, uh, of failure in that like more totalitarian way. So I, I quite like that about that approach. So in the interest of time, because we also want to yeah. like have Robin up here to, uh, up here very quickly, yeah. we have two more to wrap yeah. food. I will try. So, I will try to get through these quickly. Okay, let's do one minute each. Okay. Okay. Cool. So now we just have to solve. Now that we have said, okay, this, those are ways how we can decrease violence and how we can like uh, how we can decrease the risk of cooperation. If we want to enable cooperation, how can smart contracts and um, allow us to enable more rich cooperation? Okay. One minute, Mark. Go. So the ultimate meaning of a contract is the behavior it provokes in some enforcement mechanism. Right now, all of our contracts are prose written for interpretation by expensive experts according to rules nobody but them understands. Uh, it really doesn't serve the purpose of arranging complex systems of cooperation to help us cooperate also, these systems of human law are jurisdiction-based, and the cooperation we're interested in is trans-jurisdictional. With cryptography and modern computer security technology, and yes, blockchain, uh, all of these technologies can be brought together to create contract-like arrangements embodied as program code, where the behavior of the running program enforces the terms of the contract. Now, there's at least 4 billion people in the world today that are outside what we would call the rule of law. They do not have the benefits of being in a rule of law. And even in the US, Ten most, seconds left. most people don't have the benefits of being able to engage with the legal system because it's too expensive. If you drop those, those costs by orders of magnitude and you deploy them in a predictable, understandable way with, with less expertise needed to understand them, you can arrange global cooperation 
in a fundamentally underlying informational and therefore nonviolent medium and bring about a much more cooperative world that builds wealth much more quickly. Yeah, I like that. Like I think you know what 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 I really like about it is that currently you and I can cooperate, right? We know each other, but you know if I want to cooperate with anyone else, where even you know where we could cooperate to our mutual uh, benefit, I have to have this crazy third party, uh, and it would be much much nicer if I can just like go out there and like cooperate the, in the ways in the same way that we do with a lot more people. Um, okay, then finally. Now that we have it down, that we decrease the interactions that uh, we don't really want, and we uh, enable much more of the cooperative interactions, how can we enhance those corporate, cooperative interactions via UBC, or Universal Basic Capital? Okay, so um, uh, there's this um, concept in econ economics that's often called the Coase theorem, despite the fact that it's not a theorem, but it's a very important observation, which is once you have clear property boundaries, then ignoring transaction costs for a moment, we have to come back to that. Um, uh, uh, the clarity of the property boundaries means that uh, you can reallocate those boundaries by voluntary trade starting from there. But if you don't start off with clear property boundaries, then you have essentially uh, expensive, uh, expensive activities to claim property and those expensive activities to claim property from nothing uh, are a dead weight loss to the system. So, all of everything that is currently owned is here on this tiny, tiny rock in this vast universe. Um, there is this whole universe out there that is unowned. Um, the uh, having some means, and there's many, many hard and unsolved problems with this that, that need to be uh, thought about, um, but uh, if you can take proportion, you know, even any approximation of proportional claims to the rest of the universe and distribute it at a particular moment in time to every human being, uh, then you haven't taken anything away from anyone, but you've given every human being at that time some capital. And in a world in which human beings stop being the bottleneck on productivity, the growth of the economy should start to resemble the kinds of things that Robin talks about, of you know, things, things like a GDP that doubles every three weeks. Um, uh, you know, uh, and in any kind of massive exponential growth like that, the returns to capital are tremendous. Uh, yes? So I think the Coase theorem comes into play here, and I think that's actually yeah. awesome. That's where I started. Just, yeah. yeah. So the, the transaction cost issue is the hard issue because the universe is not one which is divisible by any, any simple means, any, any means that, that I've been able to figure out. So there's, there's some really difficult problems here. Um, uh, and you know the difficult problems, frankly, might scupper the whole thing. But I think this is a direction to look. It, gives everybody a claim that becomes valuable and creates great returns over time. Uh, uh, and it does it without trying to take anything away from anybody. Very nice. All right. So basically creating universal basic capital by not trying to redistribute resources that are already claimed and that are already distributed, but by looking into space and kind of trying to distribute the vast amount of resources that are still in space and having everyone currently alive trade on the expected value um, of that capital. That's so much in a nutshell. And I'm sure that there's a bunch of questions later. And um, you know, after Robin, after the break, we can d dive down um, into, into the discussion a little bit more. But for now, I would like to give it up to the third speaker, Robin. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> All right. The robot concerns. All right. So I'm going to talk a bit about AI today, and then we will go to AI in the long run. As you might know, this is actually a big burst of concern about AI today. You've heard a lot about it in the news. Heard a lot about it in the news. And it's really step number five. This is the fifth boom of interest in AI. The first one was back in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The major people who are now thought of as the, the big economists back then pretty much all talked about the issue of whether machines were going to take all the jobs 
and this was a big concern at the time. The next big burst of concern was in the 1930s, which according to our records is probably the most disruptive period of technological innovation, Muli Metropolis, lots of other people were very concerned that robots were gonna take all the jobs then. The first electronic computers showed up and finally people said, aha, finally, a general machine that could do anything. Now they'll take all the jobs. In the 1980s, I was caught up in the expert systems boom. I was a grad student at University of Chicago. I read about all these things in the newspaper said all the jobs are gonna be gone soon. I had to be part of this new thing. I went off to Silicon Valley to be part of that. I worked at Lockheed, then at NASA for nine years doing AI research, and, and then I left to become an economics professor. And today we're in a whole new burst of concern based on deep learning. And one of the main questions we all have is, is this time different? Are we about now to finally see that robots take over everything or not? Now, uh, there's a number of sort of crude ways we can estimate this, and I'm gonna jump through slides that you don't need to read because uh, we have some other things to get to. But basically, on a few characteristics, you can roughly estimate, well, it might happen within a half a century to a couple centuries. And uh, we have a lot of exciting new demos and things like that, but in every previous boom, we had unprecedented characteristics, unprecedented demos. <laughs> We had bursts of capital investment, labor investment, a lot of big dramatic predictions by experts. Uh, if we look at labor productivity statistics, this is one of the main places we economists would expect if, lab if robots were really taking over jobs and really working, labor should be much more productive, but it's actually down quite a bit. Uh, you might think the stock market would foresee and see stuff about to happen. Uh, we had an era in the dot-com boom about 20 years ago now where there was this enormous apparent in the market expectation that there was about to be a revolution. We kind of do see the industrial revolution in this over a slow time, but at the moment we're not seeing a revolution in the stock prices. You may have seen articles like the following in the last uh, few years. Uh, Forrester, 10% of US jobs would be lost to automation in 2019. That was in November, 2018. AI expert says automation could replace 40% of jobs in 15 years. Uh, that was this January. In my T review article listing dozens of studies over the last few years, forecasting varying amounts of job loss. My message for you is that all of these studies are forecasting future job losses to automation on the basis of people looking at jobs and guessing which jobs they think would be easy to automate in the absence of actual data on which past jobs or how automated. <laughs> That's actually the truth. None of these predictions are based on data in the past of which jobs were how automated, when. They're all based on people looking at them. And is it correct to assume that none of them took into account the jobs that are gonna get created by the- Well, they're not claiming that. They're, they're just talking about job loss. They're not addressing that. So that's fair enough for them. The, the, say again? On your previous slide, one of the columns is jobs created. Uh, okay, they're, they're not, not, in those studies, they're talking about that. Free and Osborne is one example, I'm not going to go into that, but they, they basically took 70 jobs, a group of experts said, we think this half of them are going to be easy to automate, this half not, and then they projected that under the rest of the economy, and it turns out they predicted 40% of half of jobs would be lost automation because they had a data set. Uh, they did project it under jobs, because we have a data set of those jobs, yes. They used it on the basis of these nine features of jobs, for, for particular features, but they were on jobs. Anyway, I'm going to... So I have, and my co-author, actually have a data set on actual degree of automation of different jobs over the last 20 years. And we are using that to try to figure out which jobs are all automatable and how much that's changed lately as a prelude to thinking about how much change the future. So the key point is there's a standard set of 832 jobs. We've got data for these jobs on number of workers, pay, education, and we have two major sets of researchers who made predictions about which jobs are how automatable. So we have their vectors. One was called computerizable by Bray and Osbar in 2013. Another by Rick Nelson and Mitchell, Tom Mitchell in 2018. They did machine learning suitability for jobs. We have their prediction vectors and we can look at the past to see how well their predictions apply to the past, which is always a handy thing to do with predictions. Uh, we, have for e we also have for each of these jobs a standard database of statistics about these jobs with basically 254 descriptions of these jobs, which I'll say a little bit more about. Each of these descriptions is on a one to five scale. Uh, we 
renormalize it, uh, re log scale it, renormalize it. So it's basically a normal distribution, mean zero, standard deviation one. And one of these variables is automation. And uh, here's what we can do. So this is crude, uh, just if you've ever seen a regression table, I, I will walk you through it. The dependent variable is automation. And all we're looking at here is these two previous predictions of automatability and a few other things that economists would predict. So we economists would predict all else equal, you'd want to automate a job that pays more. All else equal, you'd want to automate a job that had more employees because you're going to pay a fixed cost to set the automation and you'll spread it across the employees. So both of those are in here. We also have some education. And you'll actually see that both pay and employees are significant predictors of automation in, in the correct direction. And these co since all the variables are normalized 0, 1 uh, in terms of one standard deviation, each of these coefficients is how much one standard deviation in one variable produces a fraction of a standard deviation in the other variable. So here, a one standard deviation in pay produces a 22% of a standard deviation in automation. A one standard deviation in a number of employees produces a 9% standard deviation in automation, et cetera. You can see that these other two researchers I've highlighted in red, their estimates are quite significant, T stats of uh, you know, 9 and 11, very strong, and substantial, a third of a standard deviation and a fifth of a standard deviation. So here we can say they're right. These things they came up looking in their head, guessing which things were automatable, actually do predict automation over the last 20 years. Good job. So it's real. They made it up, but it's real. That happens. Uh, now, this model predicts 15% of the variation, which means 85% of the variation is unexplained by this model, but hey, it's only a couple variables, and they're in the right direction, all right? Now, we add all these other variables that threw it in. So we took these other 200, you know, 300 variables, basically, did a principal component decomposition of them, took the top 200 fact principal components by weight, threw all those in, did a regression, found the top 50 most significant ones, did that again in this regression in front of you. And now you see the variables we saw before, like education, pay, uh, number of employees. Pay and number of employees are both there, and they're both substantial effects about half as big as we saw before, and significant. But now the other two researchers' co vectors are not significant. They don't matter. We knocked them out. Why? Because we have more specific, more detailed variables that are more predictive. Uh, what are these things? Well, these are just factor numbers. You don't know what they really mean. But first, just know, look through the t-stats. The first one, a t-stat of 25. Uh, all the rest are t-stats well over 2. 50 variables, all highly significant, all substantially predictive automation. Look at some of these coefficients, like the ones in, in bold red, a third of standard deviation, et cetera. So you've got 50 variables each of which has a big effect on automation. And the overall R squared here is about 0.6, and you could get up to 0.8 if we had more variables. The story is, we know a lot about how to predict which jobs are how automatable. We can predict most of that variance with a bunch of variables that are really solid statistically that are really there. Now, these, these factors are a little hard to interpret, but if we look at the variables they're based on, we can also, I'll also show you a progression like that, they're, they're relatively mundane things. Like one of the strongest ones is the speed of your job is determined by the speed of some piece of equipment you need to keep up with. Turns out, if you're trying to keep up with a machine, you want to automate that job. <laughs> Put a machine in place of you because you're working with the machine. Other predictors, well, it's really noisy. You don't like the job. The job is dangerous. <laughs> Those sorts of things. There are many just mundane, obvious sorts of things you'd expect to predict. Which jobs you would try to automate more might be easier to automate. And that just is the overwhelming strength of the statistics. Today, it's not about machine learning capabilities, edge of the state of the art, how big a computer you need. Most of automation is about pretty mundane stuff. And over the last 20 years, the average amount by which automation's increased has been a tenth of a standard deviation. It's substantial, but at that rate, you need a whole century to move one standard deviation. So the rate at which automation's increasing is real, but modest. And we understand most of the details to be pretty mundane stuff. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, the danger of a job highly predicts whether it will be automated. Does that mean that you predict that most frontline soldiers will be replaced with uh, automated workers? Well, see, the, the whole key is I've got this regression function. That gives me a whole predictive model. I don't need to 
think something off the top of my head, I would stick it into the model and get the prediction out of my database, and then it would tell me. Because there's a lot of other things about soldiers that are relevant here, right? I don't just need to do on that one thing. Yeah, it seems like at least three of the measures that you mentioned, so pay, uh, number of employees, and interacting with technology, are going to inevitably lead to more and more uh, replacement of jobs. Because once you, uh, for example, replace the highest paid employees, then the next highest paid employees will be well, on the job. Well, just the fact that automation is going up gives you that same argument. Hey, take the automation's going up argument to the infinite, everything's infinitely automated, right? You don't need any, any other argument. You just you can just work with that one if you want. But it's not fast, right? Here's a radical question. Why do we care? Does your car bloom? Your I'm not do claiming we do. So so uh, actually another thing that we haven't quite done here is predict whether the number of employees goes up or down as a job gets more automated. It's not obvious that it goes down. Yeah, I'm not going to go there. In fact, I'm going to cut this off and go on to the other part of my talk, but we have, we're going to have lots of time for the discussion. So if you want to come back to this, we have lots of time. So now I'm going to switch more modes, look a little long term, but I'm going to start with two uh, key sort of pieces of insight here to work with. One is a paper from last year on the distribution of citations in different research areas. And the remarkable thing is there's a universal distribution to the, to the distribution of citations in all the different areas they studied. That is, there's every once in a while a rare paper that has a lot of citations, but most papers get, don't get very many. And this rate at which the number of citations falls off is the same for all fields, uh, which says that, um, I mean, we already know that most innovation is lots of little things. Every once in a while, there's a big innovation. And you might think, oh, that's different across different fields. But it's not, apparently, at least in terms of citations. And therefore, it's not necessarily that different in computer science or even in AI, i.e., most progress is lots of small improvements. Every once in a while, there's a big one, but that's a small fraction of the total. That's a key thing to keep in mind here. Second thing to keep in mind is people have said in the past that technology is improving exponentially, and therefore, we should expect job displacement to happen, happen exponentially. They've said, sure, you haven't seen much so far, but pretty soon you start to see a little of it. Right after, it's going to be boom. They're all gone. Now, that's not actually not obvious. We have actually seen exponential improvement in technology for a great many decades, and yet the observed rate of job displacement has been noticeable but not substantially increasing. One way to understand that is the idea that each job or each task has a certain level of computing power needed to replace it, including computing power, software, insight, et cetera, and that the distribution of these thresholds for how much it takes to do a job is log normally distributed. If that's true, then as technology improves exponentially, it'll move linearly through the log normal distribution, and therefore the rate at which jobs get displaced is relatively constant. So technology could increase exponentially for a long time to come, while not creating a sudden boom of job displacement, if we're basically somewhere in the middle of a long log normal distribution. And of course, in, in a sense, this is as if there was this fixed number of tasks, but we also have the fact that as we get richer, we invent more tasks to do. Maybe the distribution just gets bigger and expanded. All right. Now I want to talk about, from my point of view, what seems really simple and obvious. From an economist's point of view, if you imagine a future AI economy, we kind of expect it to look like past economies. What does that mean? I'm going to tell you. We expect an economy in general, all the economies we've seen really, to be granular. That is composed of many small things, many small firms, many small industries, many small workers, many small professions, as Drexler just was talking about. That's the generic thing we expect in a future economy, to be made of many small things. As I was talking about, innovation tends to be lots of little things, and so we expect innovation to be relatively smooth. Lumpy sometimes with relatively small lumps, but overall. Now, it might get faster. That's different than being smooth. 
Another thing people sometimes say is that they're worried that if technology improves faster, it'll go faster than the ability of our social institutions to manage it. And that's the risk. The technology will get out of hand and hurt us because it's going too fast. I would say, an economist would say, the ability of social institutions and social mechanisms and everybody else to adapt and use a technology is one of the major limiting factor on how fast the technology can improve. It has to, the rest, other people have to learn about it, have to adapt what they do to it, have supporting institutions, supporting techniques, supporting learning, uh, have ways to manage and control it, et cetera, in order for it to be adopted and become widespread. So if technology happens faster, it'll be because we have faster ways to socially manage it. If we can't improve our ways to socially manage things, then we can't speed up technology uh, at a certain sense, at least at a, a broad sense. We expect uh, the advantages of innovation to be that's broad spread. View. Say again? That's a pessimistic view. Depends on what you hope to be, I guess. Uh, yes? Uh, we expect uh, innovations to benefit lots of people. Most of the revolutions we've seen in the past, some small places were the first places that had innovations, but large other places nearby benefited, either through diffusion or for complementing. Uh, we actually have a good sense for the current growth rate of the economy and how it could be faster with something like AI. In actual factories today, if you look at the value of a factory and you look at the amount of stuff that gets cranked out per month from the factory, factories crank out as much stuff as the factory is worth in a few months. That means if the only limiting factor on creating wealth were factories, we could double our economy every few months. Why can't we double the economy every few months? Well, because some of the key inputs can't be made in factories, like human workers. It's the fact that those inputs are not increased means we get diminishing returns to all the stuff we make in factories. There's no point in making too many of them because we only have so many people. As you are able to slowly replace whoever is doing the task with a machine that you can make in a factory, the straightforward prediction of standard economics is the growth rate would speed up. And it could speed up to as fast as doubling every few months. That's the logic. It's nothing fancy or clever or new even. Existing economies we've seen for a century have this feature of doubling stuff in a factory every few months. So that's the reason why we might expect an acceleration in growth rates, but we might expect a smooth acceleration. So um, th then this is sort of the obvious thing. So uh, we don't expect a machine in the basement to take over the world on the weekend. And uh, that you need a pretty unusual scenario to make that work. If you're thinking about failure modes, uh, in general, in all the economies and sites we've seen so far, it's been hard to predict failure in detail much in advance. That's just the nature of most social systems we ever have. You could predict in the abstract rough outlines of the kind of things that might go wrong. But in fact, typically you have to wait to see relatively concrete versions of what you imagined before you can do much to understand their failure modes and to do much about them. And so that I predict about AI. I predict most of your work's going to have to wait till you see more actual concrete systems producing actual concrete failures. And otherwise, you can't do much ahead of time. Now, there's this old concern fear a vast ancient one, the robots are better than us, they beat us out of the jobs, they beat us out of the military, so we lose, they win. That's completely coherent. Uh, but another framing is they are our descendants. And of course, it's always been true that our grandchildren beat us out and displace us. And so you might say, well, that's kind of what's going on here. But many people say, well, no, 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 this is different. Now, how could it be different? There's two obvious ways things can be different under the simple model of descendants. The more change that happens between in any given number of years, then the more different your descendants are likely to be. Your descendants' values and their attitudes, et cetera, uh, change with the rate of the change of society they're in. We don't have firewalls around our values, so they tend to be influenced by the world we're in. And so uh, if more change happens in any given period, then your descendants are more different. So we today have more of the problem of worrying about our grandchildren and what they want than people thousands of years ago, because a lot less changed back then. And the other part is lifespans. <laughs> the longer you live, the farther you will live into the era where your children are different from you. Uh, and that would just be the obvious thing there. Now, many people say, no, it's, it's even worse than that. 
And you can have a sense, let, imagine the counterfactual, your children are very different from you in the expanding economy, but they don't go into space. Alternatively, they do go into space. In the second scenario, you expect they're a little more different from you. That is because there's a wider range of possibilities of where they live and what they do, they are more different. In some sense, thinking about your children as AIs is like thinking about a wider range of ways that they could be different to do different things. And in that sense, yes, but it's, in my mind, the same fundamental trade-off that we've, people have talked about for decades and eons even. You talk to people about modest amounts of change in the modest near term, and they go, yeah, that looks good. And you, and you just project that out. Well, if you add that up, it becomes this much bigger change over a much longer time, and they go, oh, ouch, and they don't like that. And I think that's basically what we're seeing here in the AI world, is that reaction to foreseeing more change and reaching the breaking point of going, ah, uh, a you know, flying car is okay, social media okay, maybe surveillance okay, but that's just too much. Uh, some people are framing the problem as an agency failure, which is different than these other fears in some sense. They're saying, well, you're gonna have machines that are supposedly at your disposal, supposedly serving you and doing things for you, but they're going to betray you. They're gonna be bad agents. And that's the key problem with AI. And as an economist, we have a whole literature on what's called the principal agent problem, which is all about how you can control an agent or get them to do what you want when they have different interests from you and different information, they know things. It's called agency failure. There's called an agency cost or agency rents. It's a problem, but in that theory, there's no slot for more smarter. Agents that are smarter for you are not harder to manage as agents in the standard principal agent models. And we can put that in the models. So the idea that because AI is smarter, it's a worse agent just doesn't work in our standard models here. And that's most of the time I have now. So I guess I will stop here. And I could, if I had more time, if you beg me, tell you more about what happens in the future when M's compete with the I. So these are my two books down here. Um, just as a taste. OK, so I have this book on the age of M, and eventually our brains will be moved out of our heads and into hardware. And at that point, the software in our heads can compete with other software, and it's more of a fair game. And the question is, which wins where? And to be able to answer that, what I need is a theory of the essential difference between the software that's in your brain and the other software we know about. And so I've come up with what I think is a satisfactory theory there. And it's based on, I mean, there's a number of other side things to mention, but based on the key idea that in evolution, when, when evolution was evolving and redesigning your brain, brains never figured out the difference between hardware and software. And so anytime it was going to add anything new, it had to be a package of hardware and software together, which meant when there was a hardware capacity limit, it couldn't add anything new without taking something else away or reorganizing the existing stuff to need less space. And so the brain had this enormous pressure over eons to figure out how to reorganize itself including abstraction, a key way to reorganize and save space. And so the brain is a marvel of organization and abstraction, but it's a tangled mess, it's not very modular. When you write code in almost any way you do it, you have the key feature that instead of modifying some old system and figuring out how to save space to make room for a new thing, you can start with a blank screen. That is the marvel of your coding life. You can start with a blank screen. And in that blank screen, you can make new stuff that's not that well organized. But it's modular. It's separate from the other stuff. And you can limit when the new stuff de depends on the old stuff in such a way to make it easier to modify. And that's the wonder of your code. But because it's very modular but not well organized, it rots faster. And so the code we write rots faster than the code in our brains. The code in our brains is remarkable for not rot rotting over a wide scope. And the across evolutionary time, it doesn't seem to rot nearly as much at all. And I've so this is the key of, idea. I've seen plenty of new code that's still a tangled mess. But yes, it's, but the best code <laughs> is more modular, and this is the power that you get out of a blank screen. And so this is my theory of the essential difference of the code we write, and it makes a prediction that the code that the code we write writes, code cubed I call it, is even more modular, even less well organized, and rots even faster. That is, when you run a compiler and you want to change the code, you rerun the compiler. You don't try to modify the compiled code to satisfy your new constraints. That's because that compiled code rots really fast. It needs to be recreated instead of modified. So that's my basic story here, and there's other elements of it, but that gives me a picture of how to predict, and I can say many specific things about where do human minds in the form of M's have a long future competing with the eye, even if we don't give them any 
unfair advantages in terms of competing against other AIM. And that's my talk. Yeah. All right. So for now, I would say um, uh, take a little break, right? Um, and let's try to meet here again at like a quarter past eight. And then we do in half an hour of like super chill, drink in your hand, debrief, decompression, and QA. And you can basically hurdle like um, a few questions, predictions, uh, and like criticisms at the three um, while they are here at your disposal. Uh, on the speaker stage. So let's meet you in 15 minutes, grab a drink, and I'm hoping for this to be um, quite interactive and Friday nighty. Okay, see you in a bit.